So as many of you know, today is a very important day for me. Um, I mean, not just me. I shouldn't just say it's just me. But, uh, you know, Super Bowl Sunday could possibly be the reason why there's not as many people here as usual, which, you know, that's that, that's fine. Game doesn't start till 3.30, so maybe they thought I was going to preach extra long today. Um, but uh, as many of you know, I do have, you know, a certain team in the game today that I, I don't really want to mention my name because it's, it's a church service, and so I don't want, you know, I don't want that to distract from what's actually going on here. So I'm not going to mention anything by name. I'm just going to... Uh, you know, preach as if everything is, is completely normal, um, you know, the, the, the game would be distracting to people, so I don't want to say anything, I don't know about you, I'm a little chilly in here, so I just, hold on one second, I just got to get a little blanket going on here, <laughs> I'll just put this on, so. anyway, like I said, I don't want to say anything about the game today to take away from uh -huh, sure. what we're doing here, so, anyway, Screw uh, this, what? String it up? Yeah. Um, actually, in first service, I had the pulpit out, and initially I was going to hang it over the pulpit, and then I realized I'd be hanging it over the cross, so I did not do that. <laughs> uh, anyway, but, uh, yeah, so I've been a 49er fan for a very, very long time. There's been some very dark, dark times being a 49er fan, um, and uh, it's interesting because a lot of people wonder, I was born and raised in Washington, which means I should be a Seahawks fan. And the reason I became a 49er fan is one of the first books that I ever read as a kid was about Steve Young, who at the time was their quarterback. And so I, I got drawn to, to people like Steve Young and Jerry Rice and others. And so from the age of 10, I've been a 49er fan. And uh, uh, last year, it's really amazing looking at them now that they're even in the Super Bowl. Because this time last year, they were watching the Super Bowl just like how all of us who are watching it today are going to watch it on the sofas. Um, where they had been the entire playoffs because they finished 4-12 and last year, which if you're not real familiar with football, that's like failing everything. It's just terrible. Um, and it really was a tough season. But I remained strong with them. I was very, uh, you know, yay. Um, you know, I, I, the only plus side to last season with the, was that the Cardinals were even worse. So we didn't finish last in our division. Uh, but we did get the second pick of the draft. Anyway, but I say that because you look at this 49er team that finished 13-3 and and then beat two very good teams in the playoffs, and they look entirely different. They're like a brand new team compared to last year, which is weird because they have the same head coach, the same defensive coordinator, a lot of the starters are all the same, and yet something changed. In them. And really, when I was reflecting on our passage today, I was thinking how the 49ers are kind of a picture of what we're going to be talking about this morning, of something that has just changed, that makes a huge difference. And so Paul uses some wording here uh, that is a rather bold statement. And it's a phrase that I want us to remember from this morning. It's that I am a new creation. I am a new creation. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation creation, uh, and specifically, yeah, he says new creation, and that's not a new concept to believers. If you've been in church for really any time at all, you've probably heard this, been born again, you know, I'm a new creation, a, a new work, um, and this isn't even a new, uh, a, a new concept to this sermon series. We've even mentioned it a few times of being a new creation, but the question I want us to really look at, what Paul is addressing here today is, what does it mean? to be a new creation. How did that even happen? How are we new creations in Christ? So let's go ahead and read our passage, uh, just starting in verse 16 and going down to verse 21 of 2 Corinthians 5. Paul says this, So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. And all of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. 
so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So like I said, Paul here not only talks about how we were made a new creation, but also what that means, what the effects of being a new creation are. In essence, if you're a new creation in Christ, everything has changed, whether you see it or not. A lot of us are like, well, I look pretty much, you know, maybe even worse than when I first became a Christian because the years have gone by and not been the kindest things in the world. And, and maybe you look around at our world and you say, that doesn't look different, or at least it certainly hasn't improved. So what does it mean to be a new creation? And that's the thing. It's, that it's not so much about what you physically see, but how you see it. And like Paul says in verse 16, basically the way that you view everything has dynamically shifted. You now see things differently than how you saw them before. We no longer view people from a worldly point of view. Literally, he says, according to the flesh. Some of your translations probably say that. According to the flesh. In other words, you've been given a new perspective on life and everything in life, especially people. But in order to view people properly, we have to view ourselves properly. And in order to view ourselves properly, we have to view Jesus properly. And in order to view Jesus properly, we have to stop viewing him according to the flesh. And you're probably sitting there thinking, if you are a Christian, you're probably thinking, I don't view Jesus according to the flesh, so don't worry about that. But I just want you to hear that again. We don't look at Jesus from a worldly perspective or according to the flesh, which means he is more than a good idea. It means that Jesus is more than something that makes you feel good. Jesus is more than what many people, including some Christians, view him as. And if we want to stop viewing Jesus according to the flesh, we need to understand the magnitude of verse 21. That last verse that we read in our passage. There's actually a lot of discussion about verse 21 for kind of two parts that we're going to see here. Uh, but the, one of the most foundational truths about being a Christian is the sinlessness of Jesus. Right? That Jesus was, is, and always has been perfect, that during his time on earth, he never once sinned. He never even broke the Old Testament law. He lived it out. He fulfilled it. So he never once sinned. And yet, did you see what Paul says in verse 21? God made him who had no sin, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. So how does that work? Most people, when they come across that passage, and you've probably heard it explained this way, they say that Jesus was a sin sacrifice, a sin offering in our place, which is true. That's actually mentioned a number of times throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament. Isaiah 53 is a passage that we commonly quote from, because if you read Isaiah 53, it paints an incredibly clear picture of who Jesus was and what he did. Uh, and you might even read it and not realize it's Old Testament, but it is. And one of the things that Isaiah 53 says in verse 10 is that God makes his life an offering for sin. And then Paul in Romans uses very similar language as he does here in 1 Corinthians. But he says that God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. So sin offering is basically he was the one that paid for our sin. So we needed that offering to take away our sin, to pay for it. He is our sin offering. The thing is, and the part that I struggled with when I was reading through this, is that Paul doesn't use that exact language here. Paul obviously understood the word sin offering. He knew them. He wrote about them. And yet here in 1 Corinthians 5, he says sin, not sin offering. And that's where I struggled is maybe he did mean sin offering by it, but then he says he made him who knew no sin. Obviously, it's the same word there, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. It's the same word in both of those. And so obviously, you wouldn't say he knew no sin offering to be a sin offering. So it just seems odd if his intention was just sin offering. So I struggled with this. And here's something that you're going to find as you study scripture, you're going to come across questions that you just won't ever get a satisfactory question or answer for. And really, this is one of those times, at least for me. 
Because as I read this, it's possible that Paul meant sin offering, but really I think Paul was taking it a little deeper in a way that I don't understand. Somehow, I have to believe that Paul's emphasis here is that for my sake, and Jesus, in a way I can't fathom, took my sin, all of my sin, and he owned it. My sin is now Jesus's to pay for. It. So when I did that despicable thing that I hope no one ever saw or hope no one ever finds out, Jesus picks it up and he pays for it. When, I, uh, when we blaspheme, when we commit adultery, when we give in to our rage and our jealousy, he picks it up and he owns it so he can go pay for it. He, he takes our weakest, most hidden darkness, the things we don't even talk about, and he picks it up. And he takes it with him to the cross. See, when you say, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, it's so much more than heaven. It's understanding what Jesus took from you. It's all of that. That's the picture we should have when we say he is my Savior, that he took my deepest, darkest things. And he acted as if he was the one that committed them. He paid for them. As if he were the one that owed that debt. But he did so for us. And I think that's the key. I may never fully understand the depth of what Paul was writing here. But the way that someone could be sinless and yet become sin for us is that last two words there. For us. He didn't originate the sin. He took it from us so he could pay for it. He was sinless and always will be sinless and will remain sinless. And he did that so that we might become the righteousness of God. And once you understand who Jesus is, you stop viewing him from a worldly, from a fleshly perspective. You stop seeing him as merely a good teacher who lived a long time ago, or merely as someone who, who emphasized love. Love, love, not love. Who emphasized love. Or was just as a guy that, that history records Paul used to see Jesus according to the flesh until something changed. Paul, when he first heard about Jesus, hated him. He saw Jesus as a charlatan. He saw Jesus as someone who was causing trouble with Jews and with leading people away from the truth of God. And he hated him. He wanted to kill him. He wanted to kill as many people as he could to prevent this from spreading. And while he was still breathing out murderous thoughts, Jesus met him. And suddenly, Paul realized that Jesus was not all these things he had built up. Jesus was the one that took all of that misplaced anger and frustration and hatred and took it on himself. And now Paul no longer saw Jesus according to the flesh. That same shift has to happen in our own lives. That we exchange our sin in some miraculous way for the righteousness of God. Which is another phrase that people debate in verse 21. Because Paul doesn't say he, he became sin so that we could have the righteousness of God. He says so that we could become the righteousness of God. Of God, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. That also confuses people. Because we understand we have the righteousness of God, but He doesn't say that once again. He takes it a step further. You have become the righteousness of God. For us to even understand what that even means, we have to understand what is the righteousness of God. That was a question that you could Google, and I found it terribly unhelpful, so I wouldn't suggest that you do that. Maybe just do a word study on the righteousness of God. Because basically what the idea is there is that is the character of God. He is right. Everything about him, his morals, his statutes, his commandments, all of that is just a picture of his righteousness. That everything that is right in this world is from God. So when Paul says that we have been made the righteousness of God, he's describing once again how we are a new creation. 
You once were a sinful human who betrayed God and walked away from God. Now you are the righteousness of God. God, through Jesus, gave us what Jesus deserved. And he gave Jesus what we deserve. That's basically what Paul is saying here. We deserved wrath and punishment because of our sins, and yet in Christ we received God's righteousness. We hand over our sin, and we're given God's very righteousness. Jesus, on the other hand, gets our sin. That's how Paul was able to say in verse 19 that God doesn't count our sins against us. Sometimes we have this idea that when we become Christians that our sin just disappears. Right? And we, we just think that it just, poof, it's gone. But that's not how it works. It had to go somewhere to be paid for. And it went to Jesus. You made that exchange. You gave him your sin. He gives you his righteousness. So don't view yourself from a worldly point of view anymore. Because when God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin. He doesn't see your screw-ups or your weaknesses. He, says, he sees his very righteousness in you. Because that's what he made you. You made the exchange with him. God made you his very righteousness. He doesn't see you the way that oftentimes we view ourselves or we view other people. So now suddenly, being the righteousness of God, it means that we now have the ability, the strength to do the right thing in every situation which is a whole sermon series in and of itself, but just understand that before you were in Jesus, you were incapable of loving like God. You were incapable of being patient like God. You were incapable of having God's power and God's strength. And yet in Christ, we are now capable of all those things and even more. That's a pretty awesome deal on our part, right? We hand over our disgusting sin, and he gives us the righteousness of God. And we become that. That's being a new creation. Your old self is gone. It's dead. It's done away with. Stop listening to the lies that tell you you have to give in to your sin. Because it's not true. Sin has no power over you. We'll talk more about that next week. But the, the thing is, being a new creation is not the end of the story. A lot of times we get in our minds this kind of selfish view of Christianity that Jesus Christ came to the world so that I could be saved. And then we stop talking as if that's the end of the story. That Jesus Christ came here on earth so that Mark Thomas could finally break out of his sin and be with God. That's not the end of the story. That wasn't the end of the story even in this passage. Because once you view Jesus properly, you view yourself properly, which makes it so you can view other people properly. And the truth is, other people need Jesus. If they are not in Christ, they need Jesus. We all need his forgiveness. And that's why Paul says in verse 18 that this is all from God. It's his doing, by his power and his strength, who reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Reconcile, by the way, since we've said that word about 15 dozen times today, means to just make things right. We looked at it a little bit last week, right, talking about how I have peace with God. That's kind of the idea that where there once was hostility because of our sin, Jesus took that sin, and now we have peace with God. Now I am right with God. I have a peaceful relationship. Two sides have come together. This is what God has done through Jesus, and he extended that forgiveness to everyone who would accept it. And Paul now reminds us that this isn't meant to be kept to ourselves. Remember, you are a new creation. You, are no longer, you no longer view people from a worldly perspective or according to the flesh. You now view people like how God views them. And the truth is that people that don't have Jesus need Jesus. That's how we should view them. We should stop viewing them in the eyes that a lot of us are viewing other people that don't have Jesus as our enemies or as frustrating people or as people that just make me so angry. Look at them how God looks at them. They are people who need Jesus. We have a ministry that is awesome. Our ministry is to make people right with God, that God working through us could make people right with Him. Our, our message is not to go out into the streets, and you have to say this with an accent, our message is not to go out in the streets and say, y'all are going to hell. That's not our ministry. 
Our ministry is not one of condemnation. It's one of reconciliation. That is our message that has been entrusted to us. That we go out to people. And if anything, if you want to mention hell, then tell people, I was on my way to hell. Because of my choices. Because of my sin. Because of my selfishness. And then God interceded on my behalf. And now I am reconciled. And he will reconcile you too. And it's not by your strength. It's not because you're, you're perfect now. It's because he's always been perfect. And he made things right. We have a message of reconciliation. That God wants these people. Whether you do or not, Jonah, it doesn't matter. If you get that reference, it's kind of funny. But it's okay. Um, anyway, but... <laughs> I cracked myself up. Anyway, that, but there's a progression that happens for those of us who are in... Jesus. We see Jesus properly. We see him as a Lord and Savior who exchanged his righteousness for our sin. Then we see ourselves as we really are, the righteousness of God. And finally, we see other people as they really are, people who God wants to be reconciled with. And maybe you're creative, as a lot of times we are during sermons when we start feeling convicted. And maybe you read this and you think, well, I'm glad that Paul had the ministry of reconciliation. But I don't see my name in here. To which I would say that this idea of a ministry of reconciliation traces its roots all the way back to the Great Commission. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the ends of the age. That doesn't exclude you if you're a Christian. There's no like exemption clause in the contract of God. It is all of us have this call on our lives to do something greater than what we are capable of by ourselves. And a part of that is a ministry of reconciliation. So I'm sorry. You're not being left out. I'm not actually sorry. I just, I said it. So, but there you go. We are Jesus' ambassadors. I like how that's what Paul refers to us as. We're called a lot of things in Scripture. If you're in Christ, you're called a lot of things and scripture, but I think ambassador has to give us the clearest picture of how we are to function in our world. You are an ambassador for Christ. That means that the way that you act, the way you talk, the way you manage your money, the way that you treat other people, that all reflects Jesus to other people. You realize that? When you walk outside of here or even in here, it doesn't really matter. The way that you act is a reflection of Jesus. Whether it's an accurate reflection or not depends on your actions. Just like how a U.S. ambassador goes over to a foreign place, when people see that ambassador, they are seeing America represented. Whether it's a good representation or not, it depends on the ambassador. You are an ambassador for Christ in this world. That's why you were not created new for the sake of being created new. God made you a new creation to give you this purpose of being his ambassadors here on earth. Now, upon honest reflection, not looking at other people here, seeing how they're processing this, have you been a good ambassador for Jesus? <coughs> I won't even look at you. I'll, I'll, I'll Sometimes. Yeah, that's an understatement. Um, The encouraging thing is, Paul's ministry was one of desperation. Right? If, if we're failing at this, if we look at our, our week this past week and we think, you know what, maybe I didn't show people the love that Jesus has for them. Maybe I didn't show them the patience that God has for them. Maybe my words were not the same words that Jesus would use. Paul gives us a little glimpse of desperation here in verse 20 because he says we implore you on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God. Now we don't use that word implore a whole lot so I actually like the NASB which is a pretty literal translation or at least more literal translation because it captures the idea a bit better of what Paul is getting at here and he says we beg you on behalf of Christ be reconciled to God. Now here's the interesting thing. Who did Paul say this to? didn't say it to people of this world. He wrote this letter to the church in Corinth. He doesn't say, my ministry is to go out into this world and tell people, be reconciled to God. That's already been addressed 
in this moment, he is addressing the Corinthian church, and he says, "Be, I thank you, be reconciled to God. He's writing to people who should have already experienced this reconciliation with God, but if you know anything about the Corinthian church, you know that they had their struggles. And my guess is, those of us in this room who might be feeling a little convicted, we're not the first people in Christian history to have ever struggled with being good ambassadors for Christ. And so hear these words that Paul wrote a couple thousand years ago. Be reconciled to God. Even if you've already gone through that initial reconciliation, maybe something has gotten in your way. I don't know what it could be, but be reconciled to Jesus. In order to accept this reconciliation, you have to be in Christ, which is a phrase that I've repeated a number of times this morning. You've seen it written here. What does that even mean? To be in Christ. Most people would probably just say it's those who have placed their faith in Jesus. And that's true. But if you go and you study where this phrase of being in Jesus, and where you see it a couple times in Scripture, you get twice where you see it connected to something important, powerful, and commanded by Jesus. Just look at these words that Paul says in the verses that precede our passage for next week, found in Romans 6, 3, and 5. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into into his death. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like this. Paul repeats a very similar terminology in Galatians 3 when he says that we were baptized into Christ Jesus. Now you've clothed yourself with him. There's a lot of things that can get in our way of being reconciled to God, but if it's this, thank God, just give in. If it's because you've never been baptized, then take that step today. I don't mind if I miss the kickoff of the Super Bowl, which, if you know me, you know that's a pretty big thing. Let's just get, I got the water here. It's a little cold. We can warm it up, maybe. I don't know. It doesn't matter. But if this is it, if this is the only thing preventing you from being reconciled to God, give in. And be baptized into him. Have that unity with his death, burial, and resurrection that takes away our sins. But maybe it's something else. Maybe you have been baptized. Maybe you have given your life over to him. But there's still something that is preventing you. I don't know what it might be. So think about it. Pray about it. And be reconciled to Jesus. Because he's already done the hard part. Just make the exchange with him. Give him your sin and receive his righteousness. Ask the questions that you need to ask. And make that choice. If you've never given your life to Jesus, ask the questions. Give your life over to him. Be baptized into him. Whatever needs to happen, let's do that. We're going to sing a few songs as we close this morning. In church, I want us to remember our ministry here on earth is not one of looking down on people. It's not one of condemnation. It's of humility, pointing people to the one who made us right with God. That is good news. And it's the, the good news is that Jesus has won the day, that he loves you, that he wants you. He wants to be in a relationship with you. That your relationship with God, as of right now, is broken. So God fixed it. Just accept what he fixed. And come and be united with him. God reconciled the world through Jesus. And now, we get to tell other people about him. That God reconciled the world. So we get to be his ambassadors. Don't let an opportunity pass you by. And maybe you're a little slow in the upkeep like me. I realized Friday I went to Walmart and I had an interaction where I was like, I, I, it took me like three hours afterwards to realize, why didn't I invite that dude to church? So just, if you've ever had moments like that, understand you're not alone. So I need to be praying more about that. That God would make me more aware of things that should be obvious to me. So make it obvious, pray, that you would be his ambassadors, that every action you take would be a reflection of Jesus, a good reflection of Jesus to our world. So pray, 
engage in their lives through prayer. And as we sing these songs, I invite all of you who are in Christ to come forward and take up communion, actively participating and remembering what Jesus did to reconcile us. Even if we can't grasp fully what he did, we can remember that he won. We can remember that he accomplished his mission, that he took our sin upon himself to pay for it. And he gave us his righteousness. He bore our sins as he did in the flesh, as he died in the flesh, which we remember with the bread. He poured out his blood, which we remember with the juice. Jesus reconciled you to himself. Celebrate that now as we sing. If you're able, please stand and let's praise God now.